this video is going to take you through the protist notes. So protists are something that a lot of people have no idea that they exist. Um, this was kind of a garbage bag kingdom where if something wasn't a bacteria and it wasn't a plant and it wasn't an animal and it wasn't a fungus, it got thrown into this old kingdom. Uh, this isn't a true phylogenetic kingdom anymore where it's monophyletic. So there are some protists that are plant-like, there are some protists that are animal-like. What used to be the definition for them is they didn't have any true tissues, which plants have root stems and leaves. We have like epithelial tissue, connective tissue. Um, they are very often unicellular, so the whole organism is made out of one cell, but there are some multicellular protists too. And so go with that definition of they don't have true tissues, and that's pretty much going to get you what you need to know for most of this group. Since this group is new for most people, one of the best ways to study this is look for pictures online and then make yourself some flashcards where you put the picture of the organism on one side and then other pertinent details on the other. You can do that using an online thing that's called AnkiWeb. It's A-N-K-I-W-E-B. Just Google that and it will take you there and you can create your own flashcards. There's an app you can put on your phone and that can help you study this as well. We're also going to be covering the protists in the lab, so don't think this is just a lecture thing. You're going to see it in both places. Mm -hmm. So, everything from protists through plants and animals and fungi that we're going to talk about later, they're all made out of eukaryotic cells. These are different from the prokaryotic cells that the bacteria and the archaeans were made out of because we have membrane-bound organelles. The one that's really obvious is the nucleus, but this includes all those other organelles like rough ER, smooth ER, Golgi apparatus, mitochondria. Those are all membrane-bound, and so if you have a relatively large cell with at least a nucleus in it, it's going to be a eukaryotic cell. The simplest eukaryotes are the protists, because again, a lot of these are single-celled. Uh, for this one, I'm going to take you out. This is an amoeba. It used to be something that they showed you in high school, um, and then they kind of stopped showing people things like that. But this amoeba is going to be eating some paramecia, which is another example of a protist that we're going to be seeing a little bit later on. Don't miss a moment. And of Live course TV there's an ad. Plus channels. Gotta love YouTube those TV ads. Start streaming now. All right, so this big blobby thing is the amoeba. That's a paramecium. That's a paramecium. Everything here is a protist. It's just that this amoeba is eating these other two protists. And so this would be the simplest eukaryotes, three of them actually in one place. Here in a second, the paramecia. Oh, they start to panic. They know they're going to be eaten. They know they're toast. So, you know, I'd panic too if somebody was going to eat me alive. But there you go. That's an example of a protist. They're really fun to watch under the microscope. They can be relaxing sometimes, or they can be all murdery. It just kind of depends on who you're looking at there. Let's see. Shrink that back down. Next up, um, the plant-like or autotrophic protists, they're all going to be collectively called algae. Algae includes things like phytoplankton that you would need a microscope to see, all the way up to really large organisms like kelp or seaweed that you can see with the naked eye. So if it's plant-like, but it's still a protist because it doesn't have true tissues, that's going to be in this algae grouping. Animal-like protists are called protozoans. That amoeba that you were watching hunt in the video earlier, that's an example of a protozoan. This one is showing you something called trypanosoma. It causes a disease in people that we'll talk about later on, but this is an example of a protozoan. They run around and get into your bloodstream and then make you wish you hadn't ever met them. Next up, we're going to be in this table for the rest of this chapter. What I'm giving you on the slide is what you're supposed to fill in for characteristics is car. Uh, nutrition and then relevance. I've given you the example in the box and then I'm showing you a picture of what those little guys look like there. So this is what you're going to write down. Remember, you are always welcome to pause the video so you can get this stuff written down. Um, this is euglena, which is your example of a euglenoid. Euglena is kind of special for the relevant thing that I'm telling you right here. If the water quality is nice and clear and it's a nice sunny day, these guys have chloroplasts, and so technically they could be considered algae since they are photosynthetic. If the water quality gets bad, like the water gets too turbid or it's cloudy for way too much of the day, they'll actually kick the chloroplasts out and then they switch to being more of a protozoan where they'll go out and they'll look for food to catch. Um, this is another one that I have a little video to take you out to show you. It's a euglena doing some little movements, just so you can see what they look like. I don't think we need their sound, so I'm just going to silence them this time. So this little guy is doing what's called contractile motion, or flexible movement is what they're calling it. You can see flagella, so they can use the flagella to help them swim through water. 
but it can also work sort of like skeletal muscle and it can contract and try to swim around through that contraction. You can see all the chloroplasts that are through here. So this guy is living in nice clean water and it's making its own food. You can see the nucleus kind of get, getting jammed up periodically, but this whole thing is one cell and it's living its own life. And so that is your example of a protist. Mm. All right, so there's the stuff that you needed. So unicellular, I said, elongated cells, so they can shrink up and get shorter, but they can also stretch out and get long. You saw the flagella in motion in the video a second ago, and then I've mentioned everything else on that slide. Uh, dinoflagellates are special because they have two flagella in this really weird arrangement where one of them kind of wraps around a groove that's in their cell wall. Uh, their cell wall is made out of cellulose, kind of like plant cell walls are made out of, but again, these are single-celled organisms, which plants are multicellular. Um, let's see, so most of the time your dinoflagellates are going to be photosynthetic, however, they can switch pathways just like the other little guys can. The little relevance that I'm giving you for these, um, paralytic shellfish poisoning is if there is a bloom of dinoflagellates, shellfish like oysters or clams or um, scallops or whatever, they filter feed and so they'll filter some of these dinoflagellates out of the water and the problem is some dinoflagellates produce a toxin. If that toxin is consumed by you because you ate shellfish that was eating dinoflagellates, the toxin accumulates in your bloodstream and then it causes paralysis, which means you'll stop breathing and then you'll die. So if you go to an area and you start eating their um, shellfish, you should always try to make sure there's not a bloom going on of dinoflagellates. The other example that I'm giving you that's a little bit more relevant for Texas is this little thing that's called a red tide. Sorry, I thought I had a picture, but I guess I took it out. Um, red tides are called that because you get a bloom of algae and they actually make the water look red on the surface of them. And they produce a toxin that in wave action actually gets aerosolized. Um, I have been in a red tide before and the story that I usually like to give for this is um, I have also gone through boot camp and in boot camp you get tear gas so that you can learn how to use the gas mask. And being on a beach during a red tide is just like being tear gassed. Your eyes will start to water, your nose starts to snot, so you're super sexy walking down a beach in your bathing suit just crying with your nose dripping snot all over the place. And that's because of that aerosolized toxin that gets made. So. When you start going on vacations and you're going to a beach that's nice and warm in the summertime and there's been plenty of sun, you should call a couple of days before you go to ask them, are they experiencing a red tide? Because a red tide will ruin your whole vacation. There's going to be a bunch of dead things on the beach that have uh, basically died because of the toxins they produced. Plus, it's like getting tear gassed every time you go outside. So always call ahead for a beach vacation. And then always get trip insurance so that you don't end up having to shell out money for a trip you don't go on because you didn't want to get tear gassed. Mm. Next up, golden algae. This one is problematic in area lakes. And so periodically around here, there'll be fish die-offs and they are very often due to golden algae. Um, the difference here is instead of being red like the dinoflagellates a second ago, these tend to be golden in color instead of red. These can be photosynthetic or they can be eaters. But generally speaking around our parts, if there's a fish die off, it's usually because of golden algae. Not always, but very often. Uh, diatoms. These are some of my favorites because if you look at them under the microscope, they're just gorgeous. In fact, it used to be this thing that wealthy people would do in the 1800s were, were to uh, make these slides where they would arrange the diatoms and whoever had the most artistic one like got, I don't know, the most wine that night. I really don't know if they rewarded people, but you can see they're just gorgeous. The cell walls of the diatoms is actually made out of glass. That's what silica is. It's glass. Um, and so that's what you're seeing is the cell wall of the, all the different shapes and sizes and colors and things of the glass that they make. They're kind of like making their own personal stained glass, uh, glass walls and they're just beautiful. Um, all diatoms are photosynthetic. What's special about them is if you have ever used diatomaceous earth, either as like a pool filter, an aquarium filter, or if you sprinkle it as like a pesticide around your house, that diatomaceous earth is just the dead skeletons of a bunch of diatoms that used to be alive. Uh, that diatomaceous earth can also be used as an abrasive, so sometimes you use it to like sand or smooth stuff down. And you can see why that would work. I mean, look at some of these guys. They're super pokey. You can see why they could be used as little microscopic sandpaper. Next up, brown algae. This is where seaweed is going to tend to be found. Um, so if you've ever eaten seaweed in any Asian cuisine, it's very often in this group. Um, it's called brown algae because their chlorophyll pigments are different from regular plants, and so they do often appear to be brown or browny green. 
Um, this being one of our more complex protists, it is multicellular, but again, they don't do true tissues like a real plant does. Um, but this is kind of one of our more plant-like versions of the protists. Um, seaweed and kelp, they are both very important, essentially bottom of the food chain stuff and certain areas in the ocean. Um, and so lots of things live in kelp forests. You could find sea lions traipsing around through these. You could find a bunch of fish and sea urchins and sea stars and things along those lines. Um, I'm going to start the sound and see what this guy's going to say. On the coast of California, the Ocean Adventures team dives in several giant kelp forests that look vastly different from each other. This one, a kelp forest in Monterey Bay, is struggling. See how it looks deserted? That's if you don't know where Monterey Bay is, that's where San Francisco is, and so this is off the coast of San Francisco. Because the food web here has been disrupted, partly because of decades of heavy fishing. With some time, this kelp forest might recover and be restored to this. A thriving kelp forest, teeming with life. Notice that the water looks cleaner, you've got a bunch more fish. A giant kelp plant. With giant kelp, the anchor is called a holdfast, the stem is called a stipe, and the leaves are called blades. The holdfast isn't like roots. So roots in a plant actually participate in exchange of materials. It gets water and it gets nutrients out of the soil. Here, the holdfast just does what the name says. It helps them hold on to the bottom, usually some sort of rock or coral or something, so they don't get washed away with the current. And so the function is entirely different in this from the animals. But you could see when the kelp was there and it was growing, there were a ton more species swimming around inside of it. And so it's even though he called it a plant in the video, uh, this is a protist because it doesn't have those true tissues. Um, red algae is what you guys have next. And guess what? It's algae that is red. Uh, multicellular, unlike the dinoflagellates earlier that were also red, this time we're starting to get larger organisms that you can actually see with the naked eye and not just because there's a bloom of them or a growth of them. Uh, these guys are all photosynthetic. The only example that you guys may have heard of, if you get expensive sushi, it's wrapped up in nori, and nori is actually a type of red algae. And um, the other thing to mention here is if you've ever had any product that has carrageenan in it, like if you buy store-bought um, chocolate milk, it's thicker than chocolate milk you would make at home, and that's because it has carrageenan mixed into it, and that comes from a species of red auger. Uh, pardon me, I was reading that word. Red algae. Uh, the auger we use to grow bacteria in the lab, it's also coming from a red algae. Let's see, green algae. So this is actually the most plant-like protist because it actually exhibits a life cycle change like plants do that's called alternation of generations. Uh, the example that we usually show you guys in lab for this is Volvox, which is who this is a picture of. Oh, it's kind of like Volvox. It looks like fireworks kind of blowing up when you look at it under the microscope. You can get them live and even watch them swimming around. They're really clumsy as they swim around, but all of these are colonial protists. And so you can see like that's a cell, that's a cell, that's a cell. So each one of these balls is made out of multiple cells. But from there, there's no specialization, so all of those cells basically work the same. The little things inside are actually baby colonies that are going to bud off of the adult, and so this is their form of asexual reproduction where they just kind of fling babies off into the world. Next up, we're going to switch to things that are a little bit more fungus-like for just a moment. So slime molds are more fungus-like. They are heterotrophic. What they do is they release enzymes outside of the body to digest materials outside. And then once the food molecules are small enough, they'll absorb them to the inside of the body. Uh, slime molds are really important decomposers. They're also some of the earliest forms of intelligent life. Like people can set them up in mazes and then they'll find the shortest path through the maze when you put food at the end of it. Um, this is going to start in a weird place, but here we go. I turn that off. And so this is a slime mold that's starting the process of growing. They do travel around. Um, when I used to live in Maine, it was weird. We would get slime molds that would come and like we would, rake, we would rake our leaves up and then overnight this gross yellow snot would like live on the pile of leaves. And then the next day, both the snot and the leaves were gone because they decomposed the pile. And so that's how slime molds work. I don't see them all that often here in Texas. They do exist. It's just that I don't see them as often um, down here, but that was a slime mold. 
Next up, water molds. So the key to these guys is when they release spores, the spores actually have flagella on them so they can swim around. So this is why they do better in water. It's because flagella really don't work if you don't have them in water. Um, the cell wall containing cellulose means it's kind of plant-like but kind of fungus-like. Uh, this is usually going to be a decomposer again. The little notes that I'm giving you. So Plasmopera, um, this is a grape leaf and you can see these blotches on the leaf. Well, those are areas of the leaf that are dead and the more of a leaf that dies, the less sugar the plant can make. And I don't know if you've ever eaten grapes that don't have a lot of sugar in them, but they're not super awesome and you can't make wines and things with them. So there's a lot of vineyards that are very concerned about Plasmopera because of that. Also, I don't know how much you guys remember about your history classes, but if you remember, there was an Irish potato famine. That famine was called by Phytophthora, which is a different species of water mold. And so it was a fungus-like thing, a water mold that was infesting the potatoes. And well, y'all can see, y'all wouldn't want to eat that potato either. So you can see why that would be problematic and could cause a lot of starvation. Next up, we're going to start moving over towards our more animal-like protists, so protozoans. The first group of this is going to be all the flagellates. So these guys are going to have flagella to help them swim around and then look for food. Um, the first little group, some of them can be photosynthetic, but the majority of these guys are going to be free living and living their own nice little wonderful life. Um, the things that I'm giving you here, so trichinympha. There's actually not an animal on the planet that can digest cellulose and wood. And the problem with that is termites are animals and they eat wood. They can do that because trichinympha lives in their gut and the trichinympha is a protist that can digest cellulose and wood. And so these do the digestion and the termites get the benefit from that. This is an example of a mutualistic relationship. Uh, we talked about trichomonas back in the reproductive chapter. Remember this is a protist that causes a sexually transmitted disease. Um, what I'm showing you down here in the picture is Giardia. Giardia, if you drink water, even if the water looks really clean, there can be Giardia in it, and it gives you a diarrhea that could best be described as explosive, and it's not something people tend to like to get. Um, Giardia is also something that dogs in our area get all the time, because dogs will drink out of mud puddles, not thinking, I shouldn't do that, that water's probably dirty, and it's very tough to treat because these cells are very similar to our cells and similar to our dog cells too, so it's just a little bit more tricky to deal with. Uh, trypanosomes, including Trypanosoma brucei and loci, they cause different problems, but one of them causes African sleeping sickness, which is called that because it's only transmitted in Africa by a bug called a tsetse fly. When it bites you, it spits some of the Trypanosoma into you, and then you they destroy your red blood cells, so you don't transport oxygen, so you get really tired. Eventually, you're so tired that you pretty much can't do anything and then you die and so if this isn't treated it's fatal. Um, I think I have a Giardia video for you. I'm not really sure. I don't remember what this one is. No, it's not there anyway so we won't even worry about it. All right. Amoeboid protozoan. So I showed you that amoeba at the very beginning that was eating a couple paramecia. That is an example of an amoeboid protozoan. So it's anything that moves like that amoeba did in the video earlier. So the cytoplasmic extensions that it had used to wrap around the paramecium those are called pseudopodia, and anything that moves with pseudopodia is going to be in this group right here. Um, these guys are all hunters. Remember, it ate the paramecia, so that's what heterotrophic essentially means. Um, another group that fits into the amoeboid protozoans is something called foraminiferans. Foraminiferans, um, we do actually have fossils of them around here. I don't know if you guys have ever been towards Lake Whitney, but there's a big white cliff in Lake Whitney, which this isn't. I'll come back to this in a second. But that cliff is white because it consists of all the dead shells of foraminiferans that used to live a long time ago. Now, these are actually the white cliffs of Dover, which is one of the places that's on my bucket list. I want to go see it. Um, but the reason that it's white is because their shell is made out of calcium carbonate. That's essentially chalk. And so these are chalk cliffs made from the fossils of foraminiferans that lived a long time ago. Radiolarians are kind of similar to the diatoms. They have that silica or glass shell, but they stick pseudopodia out and then they bring it back into the shell to eat it. So where diatoms were photosynthetic, radiolarians are eaters. And so that's why they belong in this group. Well, let's see if this video wants to play. So we've got another amoeba just moving around. So it mentions pseudopodia. This is a pseudopod. This is a pseudopod. It's growing a couple of new pseudopodia up here. You can see that what it does is it kind of pumps its cytoplasm into the pseudopodia so that it can help move around. This is how they find their food. This is how they bring their food back into them. Like in the paramecia case earlier, they wrapped around it and then pulled the paramecium into it. Um, they actually move much faster than this. This is slowed down a lot just so you can kind of see how they were doing its thing. 
Next up, ciliates. They are called that because they have cilia around the outside surface. Cilia is so small that it's really hard to see, but you'll, it'll usually end up looking kind of fuzzy around the outside edge, and so anything that looks fuzzy like that is going to be a ciliate. These are also heterotrophic, so earlier there was the amoeba eating the paramecium. That was this guy right here. It is the most heavily studied free-living protist. If you go find a drop of water from any lake around here, you will find some of these guys. Uh, the cilia helps them swim around in water. They're not as fast as uh, an amoeba, so they tend to get eaten by the amoeba, as we saw earlier. Um, this one, they have actually dyed some yeast, so you can watch how the paramecium eats. Bring it off over here. And so you can see he's kind of tumbling in the water. They have an oral groove that you can't really see very well. It's like right through here, but it's on the other side of the body, and it brings the yeast in through there, and so you can see it packing itself with food. Um, notice that the cilia beating also moves the water around it, so that helps bring more yeast to it. And so this is a paramecium winning the, the food battle because it's eating something that's even dumber and slower than it is. Mm. Next, last actually, apicomplexins. This is a weird group that they don't really reproduce the same way that most of the other things do here. Um, most of them don't move around all that much. Mm. Um, they tend to have fairly complex life cycles, hence the AP complexin part of their name that's going on up there. And a lot of these are parasites that can even infest humans. So Cryptosporidium, aka Cryptosporidium parvum, um, this is in the vernacular usually just called crypto. You hear about it in Texas in the summertime because some pool or some lake gets contaminated with crypto and then everybody ends up getting diarrhea that's been at that pool. Um, the pool in the town that I live in actually put in new filtration devices because we got crypto several years ago and so they put in a UV filter because the UV filter actually can kill crypto where bleach doesn't. They can actually survive in bleach because they can produce spores. Um, toxoplasma. If you've never heard of cat scratch fever, it is a weird situation where usually what happens is it infects rats and when it gets into the rat it goes up into their brain and it does this weird mind control thing and it makes the rat not afraid of a cat so it, the cat it will just walk right up to a cat and like challenge it and so cats do what cats do and then they eat that rat then they poop out the toxoplasma that had been in the rat that was causing the mind control and then rats eat poop and the cycle continues the issue with this from a human standpoint, I don't know if you guys are aware, but pregnant women should not clean out litter boxes. And the reason for that is there can be aerosolized toxoplasma when she's scooping out the litter box or when she's pouring out the old type clay type litter boxes. And if it gets into the baby, it can cause some pretty major birth deformities, even up to death. And so don't let pregnant women deal with litter boxes for cats because of toxoplasma. The final option that I'm going to give you here is one of the leading causes of death for human beings worldwide, and that is malaria. Malaria is caused by the plasmodium parasite. Plasmodium gets into human beings because a mosquito bites us and spits some plasmodium into us, and then the life cycle continues. It has a very complex life cycle that's only really living part of its life in humans, but it does some really horrible things to our bloodstream. Let's see if this video wants to play. Alright, so this is about a crypto outbreak, so this one's not about malaria. A deadly organism lurks all around us. When it strikes, it's the biggest parasitic outbreak ever recorded. There are about 101 deaths. We knew something besides the ordinary was going on. presenting cold, flu-like symptoms. Tests on the stool samples reveal the culprit. Each sample contains traces of a potentially deadly parasite. Manis can't believe what the lab technician is telling him. He looked at him and he saw in all eight of the samples that he had, he found cryptosporidium. So those red cells are the cryptosporidium in there. Um, it was being distributed through the water system. Um, it, it, I don't know if you could hear it earlier, but he said 118 people ended up dying in his town that year, and it was because of this little guy being in there. So 
This is, I know 1992 seems like it's forever ago to you guys, but it really wasn't all that long ago. We had sanitation before that, and so it's just one of those things that you can find around here that people only hear about when it's problematic, but people should pay more attention so that they don't end up getting sick. Um, this is just a different part of the life cycle of malaria, so you can see the little malaria parasites that have broken out of red blood cells. Um, we don't have malaria in the United States, although we do have victims of it. They'll go travel and then come back, and then while they were traveling, they got it and then brought it back here. Um, but it's, again, it kills a whole bunch of people all the time. There are treatments for it, but there are also malarial resistant, or there are treatment resistant versions of the malaria parasite, and so it's become more difficult to treat. All right, for the end of this one, we're going to go back to the nice standard. I'm going to post a quiz for you guys in Blackboard. Just take the quiz, and you should be good to go.